Um, I think we're going to start there. We did say 6.30, but I think the majority of us are here. Obviously, the sooner we start, the sooner we really get down to some of the detail. Can I firstly, obviously, genuinely give you all a warm welcome this evening. Um, it's nice to see so many numbers. No surprise is why. <laughs> um, and there's no surprise at the dates that all this is going to happen, because it's up on behind me. Um, my name is Gordon Owen. I'm the vice chair of the group and will be your moderator for, for this evening's proceedings. But on behalf of the uh, IOF Technology Group Committee, can I again welcome you all. Um, a few little housekeepings that are the usual, but were important in the light of yesterday. Um, there is no expected alarm tests, I'm told, or any testing to Evacuations. So if the alarm does go off, we must be sure that's for real. Um, the door is behind us and across the road and staff will then guide us through to where we should actually congregate. More than one of us actually hold a list of the delegates here so we will have a checklist to make sure everyone is safely outside. Toilets. Some of you found that if you go just across the, the corridor there to the, to the right double doors and it's signposted um, to, to your right again as you go in there. So that should be easy for you to find. But more importantly, you've all been given a, a badge tonight. Um, because in nature and, and some of the activities in this building, it's important that we wear our badges at all times. Um, even if we just pop into the toilet. Um, because we could be challenged. Uh, we will be challenged, I'm sure, by the management here. Um, and then that just might cause a few difficulties for some of us. Mobile phones, as, as, as always, please do not switch them off. Um, but do put them on silent and vibrate. Um, and there'll be all sorts of questions, all sorts of keynote things coming out of this evening. So I can ask you all to use the Twitter hashtag IOFTech. And the Wi-Fi here, just in case anyone has it, you will see it's the foundry. And the password in no case is ethical guest. That's ethical guest. Just a quick one for, for future programs coming through here. Our next T3T plus, which is the content, will be on the 21st of September and we'll be looking at some things around actual, the actual contacts, databases and things um, and, some of, and some case study around that. Um, and then we will lead up to our AGM, which is for those who are doing their diaries, that's the 19th of October. Um, and the venues will be announced nearer the time. There will be some filming and photography here this evening but if anyone has any concerns about that, if they could let me by the committee know, then we'll make sure you are shadowed so as not to appear. But on, to, on, for, the, on for this evening. Um, before I introduce our guests, just to understand the purpose of this evening. The format of the evening will be on the understanding that it's the purpose of discovery and learn. And I think actually by the time we finish, there will be a no doubt by the time we leave the door that we will have things to learn to change our processes in our systems in order to prepare for the imminent date. But it's not about a platform that we can start having a discussion really about fundraising regulation and fundraising preference service and whether it should be happy or whether it shouldn't be happy. It's not a Brexit thing whether it's going to be hard Brexit or a slow Brexit. Is it a big red button or is it going to be a little red button? These are. So when I do ask you questions, I will be asking you to just keep to the issues and the matters that have been raised this evening. Um, and I will have to politely ask uh, not to accept the questions if otherwise that arises. Otherwise, if I can move on to our guest speakers. First, but no means last. <laughs> but 
Daisy Holton, um, I did, we did post a biography there, but Daisy's skills are well suited for the role that she holds as head of secretary of corporate services, including as lead officer for the fundraising preference service and policy, having been seconded at the fundraising regulator since April. So it's been there for a little while now, but an awful lot of work in that short time. Um, she is responsible for, for, for the large scale projects that are going on. Daisy's not without experience and skills, as I said, because she's held positions of various roles in the Charity Commission, including Head of Governance and Head of the, uh, London Operations. So she comes very well understanding something of what is going to be needed to be done. So I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to ask you all to hold your questions, write them down as many as you'd like, um, but hold them until the end of both speakers, otherwise we could then move into the second speaker and not allow them to be able to complete everything. So if I could then please ask you, and welcome to the lectern, the first. Yeah, I have a it's actually a joint presentation, so there won't be a gap between us. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, so thank you all very much for coming this evening. Um, my name is Daisy Houghton, and as Gordon said, I'm, um, I work for the Charity Commission. I've been on secondment to the fundraising regulator for just over a year. Um, my background is in operations and in governance, but I have managed a few tech projects in the past. Um, many of those projects have been internally facing, and I've done a few that um, maybe are sector facing. But I've never done anything for the general public before, so this is the first time I've done a project like that. And I'm absolutely not a techie, and that's my way of saying very early on that if you've got super techie questions, then Nikki is going to answer one of those super techie questions because I can't do that. So um, I'm going to, this is the outline I thought we were going to talk about, so I'm just going to talk for a few minutes to start with about fundraising regulator generally, and then um, we're going to go into the public screens and then the charity screens. Um, and then there's, Nikki's got a few sum up, question, um, sum up slides about some of the work that she's been doing, the more technical aspects. So, to kick off with, um, so the fundraising regulator was launched last July. Um, since then, we've taken over responsibility for the code of fundraising practice. We've just closed a consultation on the code. We've had 225 responses to that consultation that are currently being considered. Um, the board in July are going to look at any changes um, to be made as a result of that consultation. Um, and we're working with the IOF on implementation dates for any of those changes. Um, oh, oh, this is not... Sorry. Um, we received um, 713 complaints from launch till March 2017. Um, and we um, closed one adjudication which was into the fundraising agency Neatfeet and H Charities. Uh, we're soon going to start publishing on our website summaries of the investigations that we've carried out. Um, so if you, you know, keep an eye on our website and sign up to our newsletter, you'll see them when we start going public with those. Um, consent and data protection have been a very large area and I'm sure something you've all been following closely. Uh, we publish new guidance. Um, and actually we'd welcome feedback on that guidance if anyone has any because we'll be updating it, um, publishing version 2 um, at some point this year. Uh, we'll also need to consider whether it needs updating obviously in light of GDPR. Levy and registration, um, I hope that those of you who are covered by our levy have paid. Um, and those of you who are covered by the levy, um, registration is now open to charities. Um, you, know, you can pay £50 and register. Um, and we're soon going to be opening to fundraising agencies as well. Um, I think so. That. So that was, I'm now going to really talk about FPS. Yes, but before I do, I've just got one slide which is especially for you, and that's because no one else is ever going to be interested in this apart from perhaps this audience. I don't even know if you're going to be interested in it. But um, in the last, since we launched in July, we've just had so many technology projects that we had to get up and running. This is a little list of them for you. Um, and um, usually I think in an organisation you might do one or two of these in a year, but we have to do a huge number of them all at once. 
And there's one of them there that I haven't even put on the list, um, and that is that we will soon be um, launching our public register of all the organisations that pay the levy and have registered with us. So that's quite another big piece of work that we'll be, um, we hope to launch. Might launch it before FPS, we'll see how it goes with the testing. So that's the kind of background to everything we've been doing. Um, I'm now going to talk to you about the main event. This is the thing I think you're all interested in. Um, just to say that obviously the system isn't yet live. That screen you had when you walked in that said coming soon, that is the holding page and that is live, but nothing else is live. Um, so the thing I'm going to go through now are dummy screens that have been produced just for demonstration purposes. And some of the, some of the things have been slightly truncated so that it's not really boring and watching me click, but we'll kind of get the gist of it. Um, I know it might not be that easy to see some of these screens when you're right at the back, but really they're just to illustrate the customer journey. So hopefully, even if you can't see the detail of what's written on them, that won't matter. And actually, I hope you don't see the detail of what's written on them, because they would have changed since these were put together. So hopefully this will give you a kind of overview. And I'm going to start with the public screens, and then I'll talk you through the charity side of things too. Um, just one more caveat before I start. And that is that we have on public, we have on purpose not used the word suppression in any of the public facing screens because we don't think the public necessarily know what suppression means. But I will use that phrase tonight because I assume that you all know what suppression is. So where I say suppression, imagine it won't exist in public. So here you go. So it starts. A, mum, a member of the public comes to the FPS. Um, and first thing I wanted to say was that it's. It's purely a transactional website for the member of the public. Um, there, it isn't a website. There is an FAQs bit, and there is a data. There are a few. You can see if you read them on the top right. There are a few links you can click to, but mainly we're assuming everyone's coming there just to make their FPS request. So it's been designed as a transactional site. Um, so you start off with a welcome screen. Um, there are two options there. One is to start, and the other is to start a suppression on behalf of somebody else. Now, I'm not going to take you through the detail of on behalf of somebody else right now. Um, it practically mirrors the, the path that I will talk you through, but it's just to let you know that exists. So you click and you start the process. What you do next is you search for a charity. And you have two options to do that. So you can do that by charity number or by name. And if you, go, if you choose to do it by name, um, there is some intelligence built into the search, which Nick can tell you about. But basically, um, it means that we, what we've tried to do is charities that spend the most will be pushed higher up the list. And we've tried to deal with acronyms and things like that. Um, and there's another thing um, that we have done that we should, I think will help the public identify charities that I'll talk about when we get further through the slides. So, this is your results slide. It's your results um, of your search. So obviously these are made up dummy charities. Um, and, um, and uh, this you'll see, they've got, chari they've got logos in, and underneath the charity name there's a space where charities can add up to 200 characters to describe their charities. So when you get yourself set up on the portal, and I'll tell you all about how to do that in a minute, you can have the option to add your logo and add this text. And the reason we've done that is because um, the research we did through the Have Your Say consultation, um, which many of you may have been involved in, um, said that the public found that um, you know, logos were the easiest way of identifying the charities that they were looking for. So that's an option for you. So you find your charity, assume that these are the correct charities, you click on the charity, and then you get this pop-up box. And under this pop-up box, you can choose the channels that you wish to suppress. So you can choose to suppress either post, telephone, email, SMS, um, or you can choose all of them. So you do that, you click on your channels, and then you get this confirmation box. And you can either here choose to, if that's it, if it's just one charity you want to suppress, you say that's it, thank you very much, or you can click to add another charity. Um, you can add up to three charities per request. So that's no bigger, no more than charity on register, just up to three. And if you want to get more than three, you have to go back on and do the process again. So, assuming that someone's got the charity they want, they've chosen the channels that they want to suppress, um, and that's it, they then get to this screen where they need to submit their details. Now, there's pop-ups here in that purple blob you can barely see on the top right, um, which give um, directions to the member of the public saying basically that they need to try and fill this in as accurately as possible because this is the information that charities are going to be using to match them on their databases. 
Um, and we put quite a lot of effort into all of this advice for the public and explained, uh, there's something I mentioned said earlier on, which is we also tell the public when they're doing the search for charities where you can find a charity's registered charity number because that is the best way of locating the charity that you want to press. Uh, in the bottom blog, which you probably can't see at all, um, there's something which asks your confirmation method. So you have to choose whether you want to have a confirmation method which is by SMS or by email. So you do all that. You get this summary screen where you confirm that those are the details you've entered, that's the charity you want to suppress, those are the methods that you want to suppress. Um, and you can edit any of those if you've made a mistake or something wrong. You then click on a button that says um, convert and send a confirmation code. And then a code is sent to you, either to your phone or to your email, whichever you ask for. And you have to submit that code, like you do with online banking, you have to come back in and type that code in. And if you've got any questions about that, then... Um, and uh, then you get a confirmation screen, which just says that your press has been processed and it gives you the details. And then a copy of that screen is also sent to the confirmation method you chose. So a URL will either go to your SMS or a copy will go to um, your email. And on this confirmation code is a reference number that you can use to reaccess the system if you need to. And that's the end of the public process. So I'm sure you're going to have some questions about that. But before um, I take any questions, or if do it to any questions, I'm just going to do the charity portal because I think that will answer some of the questions you may have. So that's that's what the public will see, and that's the end of the public process. So charity screens. So this I think really is the main thing. I keep trailing myself. Um, so just to say, this system. There are not many people who've seen this system. We have tested it with um, 10 charity testers um, covering the main database supplies. And before I move on, are any of those testers here? No one's going to admit to being a tester, even if they are just there. So just check. Um, uh, and there is a slide. Um, I'm not going to tell you right now how you're going to get onto the system. There's a slide at the end that tells you all what you need to do next to set yourself up. So I'm just going to show you um, how it all works. But just to say that all charities will be supported in using this side of the system by Serenis. There's going to be guidance, there'll be webinars, there'll be videos, and there'll be a telephone helpline to help charities to do this. So, you go in. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is again, I've slightly condensed these screens for you. Um, so, you go in, and the first thing you have to do is to sign up some terms and conditions. And then that takes you to a setup wizard, and there's three steps to the setup wizard. So step one, you set up your users on the system. So this is the people that are going to have access to the suppression requests. So I imagine for most organisations, that will be your database administrators or whoever it is in your organisations and the databases that you're dealing with your databases. Um, you can have up to three active users at any one time. And it's up to you to keep them updated and to manage leaders and joiners for your organisation. So you set them, you maintain them. You can have more than five, but only three can be active. So if people go on long holidays or whatever, you can cover up that. So first of all, you set up your users. Then the next thing you do is um, you've got the option to add your logo and 200 words about your charity. So the 200 words, can I, you know, they sort of explain what you do. There might be some organisations, obviously I work for the Charity Commission, so I'm aware of the complexity of some charities. So you might want to say, you know, this is a linked charity, or this is the main national charity, or whatever it is, you, you know, it's up to you what text you want to put in that box to help the public to identify you. You can update that anytime, so if you get a new logo, you can put that in, you can change the text to what you want. You're in control of all of that. And then the third step of the wizard is that you set up how you'd like to be notified, how often you'd like to be notified about suppressions. So you'll get an email informing you that a suppression request has come in against your charity, and you can choose whether you get that notification immediately, daily, or weekly. And you can, you can select different ones for different users of the system. So there might be some people who really want to know straight away, or there might be people who can handle just having it every week. Um, so what happens if someone lodges a suppression request against your charity is that you will be emailed to say there's something they're waiting for you on the portal and you need to access the portal to go in and pick it up. The requests themselves will not be emailed to you, so you have to go in to collect them. Um, there is an option 
to add an automated SFTP delivery of your requests. But just saying the letters SFTP has taken me to the edge of my knowledge and understanding on that topic. And so there's the lady who will explain anything more you want to know about SFTP. So that's the end of the wizard. So the portal, if you were coming in after you've set up and you're just going in any other time and you've been, uh, you know, you want everyone set up and you've got something that says you've got a request. Um, there are a number of um, banners, there's a banner, all these, are they called banners? I don't know, those tabs, tabs maybe, along the top, but I'm just going to talk you through those. So if you log in any other time, um, this is what you come to first. So this is a list of your requests, so the suppression requests that have been made against your charity. Um, you can uh, come in and check this at any time. You don't have to wait for that email telling you. You can access the portal whenever you like. Um, and you can filter it by day range, however you like. You, know, you can put in whatever range you like and filter them all. Um, and uh, you can download it at any time. So that's your main request screen. The next one um, is follow-up. So I'm just moving across those tabs at the top. So follow-ups are where um, People have put in a suppression request and then they've continued to hear from your charity. So using that code that the individual member of the public was sent at the end when they got their confirmation email, they can go back into the system with that code and they can say, I'm still getting communications from that charity even though I asked to suppress them. And if 28 days have passed, it will fire a reminder to you. So a follow-up request will only come through if the individual has still had communications from you after 28 days. And there is text on the public facing side that says it may take some charities longer, um, particularly if it's a post or appeal, um, but 28 days is the kind of minimum that we expect charities to be actioning the request. So if, it's, so if a follow-up comes through, it comes up to a separate place, and that's basically to say to you all, this is a bit more important because they've tried to do this once already, and this is the second time they've come into the system to do it. So that's follow-up requests. We then have a screen um, which just shows you the history of all your exports. So if a, I don't know, a manager wanted to go in and see how often people have been downloading or what you've done when, there's some management information there. And this is all just for your management information benefit. It's just so that you know what's been going on um, with the portal. There's then, sorry, I'm slightly whizzing through because there's then a tab which is a help function and you can, you can put you know you can write in your help question and someone from Serenis will get back and help you. Um, and there's also a reports function too, but I haven't got a visual of a reports function because um, it wasn't really like this. <laughs> um, so um, I'm done. Yeah, these are the slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, a couple of things, just um, because we so these were mock-up slides and things have moved on slightly from that is actually, as well as being able to put in the 200 uh, characters about your charity there's also a field for you to actually uh, put the charity name in now this is because a lot of you probably know your charity names are very different to what people know you as so this basically creates a secondary name so that when people are searching they can either get you on your formal name or the name that most people know you as and we assume that you know how most people actually will search for you and find you. It's all about making sure that actually the right charity is identified when there is a suppression request, rather than there being any confusion and that going to a charity who has done anything wrong with it. So, the format of the data files. We talked about the fact that you can go in manually and you can, you can put date ranges in and you can download file, but you can also set up an SFTP. You can actually set up two SFTP locations and you can choose basically when those deliveries happen. Um, there's subtly different formats between the SFTP files that are delivered to you and the files that are uh, given to you when you manually go in to download. And I should point out in that log where you saw all of the downloads, you're able to access every single file that's ever been taken from the system. So any file that's been delivered by SFTP to you or that you've downloaded, there is actually a copy of it there so you can go and get it at a later date. And you can also search those files um, to look for when somebody was actually uh, supplied to you. So if you've got a follow-up request and you think, well hang on, I think we've actioned them all, you can actually go in and search and see which file it was that it was, it was actually delivered to you in. So you can go back and check maybe the rest of those files just in case there was a problem. So you can actually search through all of those deliveries by what was the content that was in them. So for the automatic delivery, 
we're actually doing this on a very transactional way. And we went through with um, the majority of the uh, database and CRM uh, providers within the charity sector. And it's transactional in that you get multiple rows for request. You get a row by channel. So if I go in and ask for a suppression where I'm saying, please, I don't want any email and I don't want any post, there would actually be two rows for me in that file with a type of either um, uh, email or post. So because that's the way that most systems hold their suppression requests or their, their permissions within the CRMs. So we wanted that in a transactional manner where you have multiple rows. If I um, suppress myself from uh, three channels, then I'd have three rows. You get the gist. So that's actually how it'd be for the, um, for the automated file. And if you do want a copy of the automate, of actually a sample file, then I'm going to be showing you an email address in, in a little while. And if you actually contact that email address and request a copy of a sample file, we'll give you a sample file of what an automated files look like that will be delivered to your SFTP. For the manual files, I said they were subtly a little bit different. Well, the point is, for a manual file that you're downloading, and this is very much targeted most probably towards the <coughs> smaller charities who aren't going to have the automated feature set up and picking up files, um, we've actually had it so that the, all of the uh, channels that people request to be suppressed on appear in one field. So you've got one row per person. So, so that's the difference. So rather than having multiple rows for each of my channels, you have one row. Because if you're manually looking at a file, you're manually downloading your spreadsheets, it's easier to understand that way. In every file, you're going to have the reference code, which is the FPS reference code, which is uh, if anybody has a query, that will be the code that everything relates to. Everything gets tied back to that, that unique code. System security. Um, this is just for the, for the techies in the room <laughs> to give you a little bit of what we're doing. Um, we're starting off on uh, TLS uh, 1, going to 1 1.2 uh, later on in the year, hopefully. It's all to do with supporting the most number of browsers and connectivity. Um, a point about the data the data is stored in, currently in the uh, UK and Ireland. Um, and the terms and conditions about this data and when somebody gives you this data suppression means it can't be exported outside of the EU. So we can't allow, for example, SFTP um, sites to be set up that are actually, yet, and we ask you to confirm this, that are outside of the EU. So you cannot transfer people's personal details outside of the EU without their permission. Um, when you first got on, as we said, we will be actually um, giving you the terms and conditions which will set a lot of this out. Um, the charity users, the way that you'll be able to, to log in, um, there's two factor authentication on that, so you will actually be uh, going in and you get your code emailed to you to put in. Um, and <coughs> we do actually allow you to set your own password. Can I request that people are sensible about this? Because it doesn't matter what algorithm I put onto a password field um, about trying to make it alphanumeric and all the rest of it. Try and avoid obvious passwords um, because things like your charity name in the password string, it's just a word of advice. We do the two factors so that it's, it's got a backup. But if we could avoid really obvious um, passwords, you would be amazed. I don't want to be bad. The system will be available 24-7 um, apart from one 10 minute uh, interval which is um, very early on a Monday morning where we do an entire network backup. Um, so we have for about 10 minutes while that entire backup is taking place. If you do have any issues or questions or you want that sample of that automated file, then the email address that you need to use is support at serenis.com and somebody will get straight back to you, uh, send you a link to the file. Also, if you want to come on board before you get a request, so I should point out that 
Although we're actively with the larger charities, trying to get you on board, get your details in. If you want to come on board earlier, before you get a request and go through, so you can put your details and your logo and your correct charity name, more than welcome. Again, if you email this email address, we'll send you a link um, to where you need to go to be able to do it. Um, and it's, a, it's basically a form process which we have to get authentication from your individual charities. There's, uh, the next slide actually illustrates that. Ah, yeah. So basically, um, for charities um, who spend over £100,000 a year on fundraising, so those that are covered by a levy who have paid the levy, um, those charities have been contacted already. You should have had an email to your CEO um, on whenever they were on the 8th of May and the 8th of June. And if you haven't had one, then get in touch with, um, with us and we'll make sure that that is fixed. Um, for all other charities, uh, we will contact you only when you have a suppression. So the assumption is, is that the vast majority of smaller charities will never need to be set up on the FPS because they won't get a suppression lodged against them. So that's in that case, um, if a suppression is made and you haven't already been set up on the system and you haven't proactively contacted Serenis to get yourself set up on the system, an email will go to the contact that is on the Charity Commission database and that will say you now have had a suppression request made you need to go and get yourself set up on the portal. Um, so the next slide just says questions, so if you like, we could just leave that one there because that one's got more things to do on. And that's the end. Oh, okay, the time we've all been waiting for. The questions, is, I think there's some clarity now as to how it will work. We know when it's going to work. Time will tell what the TV problems will be, as with any new system. But I'll take some questions as we go along. Could I ask you, please, because there's an exciting mix and match of audience today. So if we could just identify ourselves by name and organisation, that would just be helpful. <coughs> so, yeah. Hi, Carolyn from East Anglia Airlines. Um, we know what we can do. We know what the public can do. When are they going to be told they can do? What's the launch to the public going to involve? Is it going to have the Daily Mail saying, look what we've done for you? Yeah, so we're just planning the comms plan for the launch. There will be some media activity around it, um, which is just being finalised. Um, the other thing we're doing proactively is we're um, going to charities that work particularly with older vulnerable people or with people who we think might want to access the FPS and we're um, giving information to them that they can give to their frontline staff or pass on to people who may need it directly and we're producing some like posters and postcards and things like that so if, one of you, if any of your charities are in that category we'd also be really keen to hear from you so that we can promote the service. Right. I'm Brown Fielding from Protection. Who's the data controller for the personal data on the FPS itself? Which organisation? You want the data <laughs> so the fundraising regulator, regulator is the data controller, we are the data processor. There you go. So, um, if we, oh, sorry, Geth and James from the MS Society. Uh, if we fail to match a uh, record that we receive through from the FPS to our database, is there going to be guidance on what we're expected to do with that? Do we need to add it to the database? Do we need to notify that person that we're now processing their information? Okay, so um, there is some guidance on this, but only, only kind of very summary guidance. So if the person is absolutely not on your database, then you should add them as a suppression to your database. If there is a match, or a partial match, or some of it's there or some of it isn't, we're not giving explicit advice on, you know, in which circumstances you should or shouldn't assume that it's a match. I mean, we're kind of assuming you do this already and that you must have policies that you apply when someone makes a request and, you know, whether or not they're exactly the right person. Um, and so we're sort of asking for a common sense approach to whether or not it's a perfect match. But if they're not on there, then you should definitely add them as a suppression. Because it may be that people are just saying, you know, it's not that you've, you've you know, caused me any trouble in the past, it's just that I'm kind of proactively deciding I don't want to hear from you. Thank you. Um, Amy Klein from Great Woman Street. Um, is it possible to see the consent statements at the point of capture that you're using in order to qualify passing your data to us? In the terms and conditions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we probably, yeah, we could make, we could make some conditions available, yeah, we can put them up somewhere, yeah. So, yeah, but the, so that's a, the, the question at the beginning there was, was asking whether the consent that's retained there could be made available in some way um, to charities so that they have that as their evidence as well. Um, and, the, and the answer to that is that it's contained within the terms and conditions, um, but that can be made available for any charity on request. So they're currently being finalised. As soon as they're finalised, you can see the T's and C's and exactly how you're supposed to, what you're supposed to do then. I'm going to stand up because I don't want to miss any, any hands that have done that. I can barely see some fingers from where I'm sitting down there. So I'm going to forgive me standing up there. But I'll start with the lady here. Kirsty Telford, Plumson Archives. Just had a question. I know we didn't see the mock-up screen for when you're registering on someone else's behalf. But if you could explain to us what the mechanism is for registering on someone else's behalf. How we found out they should be suppressed if anyone. So, there so is. let me talk you through that, that strand. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. So, if you're, if you're lodging a suppression on behalf of somebody else, you basically follow the same process, you find the charity, you choose the channels, and then when it gets to the contact information screen, there's an extra box which asks for information about you. So, it asks who you are, it asks for your name, it asks for a relationship to the person that you're suppressing. And then it asks for a method to confirm, where you, so you can do the confirmation code bit, so you know your phone number or whatever. And then um, what happens at the very end of that process is that we send a hard copy letter, in addition to all of the other things I've, always, I've described, we send a hard copy letter to the person who has been suppressed. So they have some evidence in case anyone's trying to do something that they're not happy with. So they get a hard copy letter to say someone's made a suppression, oh, it says actually X person has made a suppression on your behalf. These are the charities they've tried to suppress. You know, if you're unhappy, do something. Contact us. Yeah, contact us. Yeah. Right, I'll take one on the other side. The gentleman at the back there. Uh, um, the second, I'm just going to follow up. The gentleman asked a question earlier about the, um, the data processing. Um, because you think if the if the um, are, are when they sign up, are they the, are the privacy notices saying to them that this is you know that we're now processing your data or we now have to actually write to them and do that? Because yeah. obviously when we take information on who we can data process it, so they can't be in front of Yeah. Um, no, it's okay. So basically as part of the process within the T's and C's explaining to basically when they're putting uh, in their data, they're made aware of the fact that you're going to be using their data to make a suppression, that therefore you're going to have to process the data in order to actually apply that suppression. Yeah. So that's taken care of again within the TCCs where it's very clearly laid out for the general public exactly what's going to happen with their with their data, the fact that we are going to hold it, pass it to your cells, you're going to need to process it in order to match. And that, sorry, that data that information isn't in the TCCs, it's in, it's in the yeah. explanation boxes when they're filling in their personal information. And there's, so there is no requirement, there should be no requirement, for, and we try to design it so there's no requirement for charities to ever go back to the individual. I mean, that's kind of the whole point, is that we don't need to do that. And that we, they also, in their, in their FAQs, we do give the very few examples when you might want to do that. For example, if there's a standing order or there's a gift day thing, whatever. But basically, the assumption is that you shouldn't need to go back to the individual. And there is also a very good definition, isn't there, of what is fundraising activity and what is administration activity. So if somebody already has something like a direct debit set up, it does explain to the public that this obviously doesn't cover those doesn't administration. Stop the direct debit. Yeah. Right. Lady, just the front. Just the halfway this. Yeah, absolutely. So it's entirely up to you what you put in that box. Um, I would say that um, some of the messaging to the public, we are saying to the public, um, 
not obviously on the poster there, but where we've got a bit more space to explain things. We are saying that the easiest way to suppress a charity you no longer want to hear from is by going directly to the charity. But we do, you know, we do set out some circumstances in which people might prefer to use the FPS, such as if there's multiples or if they're embarrassed about going to a charity they've been a supporter of for a long time, or you know. So we do say that it's preferable to go to the charity. <coughs> just, just a quick follow-up. Uh, Colleague, uh, I sent you for a screenshot of it before, and it said it, uh, it was 200 characters on the team of It is too sorry, sorry, because it's not just sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, David. I should have to touch on that, but I do have a <laughs> Okay, I think, I think we might get some merits back on that. It's, not, it's only about 30 words, so it's not going to. It, it might be quite challenging to make use of 30 words. But, but we can look at it later. It's probably not going to be One of a, a logistical um, question, really, about the download reports. Um, you've got two types of them. I'm assuming that once you've downloaded, you've kind of cleared the list until the next time you download, is that right? Yeah, or so on the actual download, you can set any number of filters, so you can set the, the type from, you know, whether it's email, global, whatever, date fields, it's on the manual one, date field. Um, there's all different things you can set, and then you can just download the results that have been given back to you. With the automatic ones, they are naturally a delta. So the automatic uh, SFTP deliveries are naturally a delta. But with regards to the manual ones, you can, you can go and get anything that you want because you might want to go back historically. It's, you know, it, it's up to you. you. You put your filters in. So if you don't have manual one, it's not going to affect the delta. If you've got the delta, no, it, well, that's the, going to be the, uh, the manual ones do not affect the deltas. If you set up SFTP, you're automatically going to get those deltas. And remember, there's, there's two locations. So if you set up two locations, those deltas will go to the two locations. Because we're assuming uh, with large test, you're going to have data processors or a mailing house or somebody that you're going to want to send the file to as well as receive it yourself. Okay. Um, I've got two things. I'll, uh, I'll write that up first. Sorry, that's it. Yeah. And from St. Mungo's. Um, I made posters, but can someone come and just sort of opt out of all charities? No, a maximum of three per visit, and then they'd have to go back in and do another three, and go back in and do another three. So when I say go back in, it means they'd have to give all their personal details again. So at the moment, it's set at three. Thank you. Do. Um, Jeremy and Jamie from ASI, um, I also probably missed this in the presentation. Is there something to prevent someone going on and trying to pretend to be someone else and opting out of something? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> um, so basically that's one of the reasons why we obviously do the two-factor authentication. Um, it's is, it, yeah, it's only email or SMS. There's a number of things that we do capture though besides that. Um, just the standard things about the fact that the request has been made. So that if there is anybody who is potentially being mischievous, you'll know about it. But so we're doing certain. Know that because the charities you're, are being you're not going to be able to to obviously you know go to every individual and validate them back through can't do that but what you can do is if somebody's mischievous they tend to be mischievous multiple times so we do as a system point of view look for mischief if we're seeing lots and lots of activity from one location uh, for multiple people that obviously gets flagged up to us for us to actually have a look at so there's a number of different caveats but you can't actually physically go to every single person and validate who they are I know this I know it sounds like a pretty aggressive thing to point out but Say I was a competitor of an organisation that had a really big contacting that organisation. What would prevent me from, from doing um, you could uh, you would have had to have had obviously some two factor whether it was an email or whatever. If it was found that um, there had been a uh, Something that is in is essence and is fraudulent. You know, you're going, you're going. That's a fraudulent activity. Um, and given that we will be obviously capturing various things um, with each um, suppression request, um, activity logs, IP addresses, all the, all the usual around it, then we'd have absolutely no problem with actually reporting that to the authorities. If it, if it was found to be important. Okay, <laughs> I'll take someone who hasn't asked a question and then I'll come back. I haven't forgotten, but I've just come through there. Um, lady just at the middle bit. Hi, 
Okay, um, I'm going to go there's still much that we've made accessible um, and what you've been to show that the same customers so they have to use it effectively. Yes, yes. Um, there's various things we've put into the website to enable um, so different sort of readers um, with the quotes in the tabs. The, the normal stuff that you need for the extra software that knows how, how to pick things, things up, sort of like for the visually impaired, etc., are all in there. So <coughs> any of the additional software should find it quite, quite easy to go through. Okay, throws here. Okay. Hi, uh, Graham from Royal Horticultural Society. We've got about two million uh, sort of active members uh, donors from our database. Um, we're obviously concerned that already we have multiple generational families who are members, uh, often with the first initial, not with the same address, often share the same email address and some phone number. Um, how are we supposed to cope with that if, if one of the, the parties just puts an initial in, or uh, Ben, or something, Will, or something like that, where we've got, we have got numerous people who do genuinely, you know, father and son got the same names, they're both members, we can't tell them apart, how are we supposed to do this? On this I mean, system? I think this is something we have thought for a long time about, and, you know, Mr and Mrs, and all those examples, but, I mean, you know, we've, we've swung on a pendulum between providing really detailed guidance on what charities should do about that, and you know, and, and on not and on not doing that, and we've kind of come down. Well, we think you're already you're, you're already doing this. You know, you somehow you're making people must already be making suppression requests to you. You know, it's a judgment call. You know, so we usually you, have them on the phone, so we can say <laughs> yeah. which one are you? Know, what, what is it we've done wrong that you want to to talk to us about? Whereas I, I do think like the, the, the chap over there, I think there will be misuse of this. And I think you know charities are going to suffer from it when, especially for like, charities like the RHS, we don't get a huge number of complaints, hardly any about fundraising. We don't do any aggressive fundraising. We never have. We can feel we can be punished. You may never get. A, you may never get a suppression request. Mm. I'll let you know when we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take. I'll take by the back there because that's not as good. Um, so two things to say about that. The first is that we um, had a, a consultation called Have Your Say that many of you may have been involved in, where we sent a question, a couple, few questions every week for eight weeks, and we sent questions to the public and we sent questions to charities about the FPS and you know what the logo should be and in fact what it should be called and all these sorts of things. And one of the early questions was, how long do you think a charity should take to activate a suppression request? And we asked that to both the public and the charities. Actually, both of them said that within 28 days was the most reasonable, which I was surprised about for charities, because we'd heard a lot about, especially direct email campaigns, you know, yeah, having a lot of lead in time. Um, so what happens after the 28 days is that you just get it fired again. So um, if, if they come back, if they then come back and say it still hasn't been actioned, then they are given the option to make a complaint to the fundraising regulator through our regular complaints process. And obviously, if you were able to, you know, if, if there, there was a reason for that and it was that there was something sat in the mailing house for some months before or whatever, then, you know, that would be taken into consideration. So the follow-up is just a kind of extra flag to say someone's tried to do this and they're still upset because something's, something's you know, some further contact has been made with them. And then we ask for a further 28 days. No, we don't. Uh, is there not no. So it's... So Watch this space. Yeah, so, so, there's a, so there's one, so there's one follow-up, and then there's, if you're still not happy, yeah. you can make a complaint. Right, just before I got to some and, we, and the complaints are directed to the fundraising regulator rather than to the charity, because the assumption is they've gone to the FPS because they didn't want to go to the charity in the first place. So how long is that if you still want to make a complaint? It, well, the, if you want to make a complaint, it's forever because so as, as it, it could be. So if we get a notice at 28 days, or they get a notice, and then do we get the opportunity to say, well, there's a reason? Yeah, you would 
we, as you would with any of our complaints that we're handling, so the first thing we do is go to the charity and say, we've had this complaint, um, you know, what, have you got any you really want to know I'm not in the complaint scheme, but I don't know what they say, and then you explain to us what happened or something. I guess it feels like that just might generate unnecessary trivial complaints because I think that that will happen quite frequently because that's one of the things that our support and agents team get, like, I actually stop playing this, why do you ask me to express me, we've just received it, and that's the kind of frequent sort of complaint, and I think that's just going to trigger unnecessary ad for the next few minutes, then that's it. It's very Okay, just before, I know there's two St. Mungers there, but there's, there's a lady behind in the chair in the green. Or, or turquoise. There we go. Hi, I'm Helen Alcaraz. So, TPS and MPS, we can get an external agency to screen our data against that list, and that's kind of a fail safe in the 28 days state. Is there potential in the future for us to let an external agency access everybody that's ever? Request of FPS. If we have to give them a code or whatever so that they can access our charity's data on our behalf to screen against our existing list. Okay. To suppress that. So, this is why there's two SFTP delivery. Yeah, quite 20 different mailing houses, fulfillment housing, telephone agencies. Well, you choose to do the distribution. So, yeah. for example, the majority of SFTP software now allows you to have an automatic distribution for anything that gets delivered into a certain folder, which you may then decide to actually distribute it out. Um, so, but it's a case of we have to know that, because we have a log to make yeah. sure we have actually delivered that file to that place, and obviously we have to make sure it's successful, which is why we're limited to two, because at the end of the day we've got to support it and make sure that they're actually being delivered, and you know how often SFTP details change, and all of a sudden there's a firewall change, and everything stops working. So we're naturally monitoring that all the time to make sure that they're actually getting to you. So I'd love you to be able to have hundreds of SFTP, I but I can't support them all. <laughs> Okay, just before, before there, there was a person that had their hands up at the back, the, the, there's the lady there, yes. Oh, hi, uh, Jane, can you tell me about something? Um, so if someone signs up on this and we see a person on our database, but then they come back around with our website mm -hmm. and then come back in again, mm -hmm. we've got two conflicting, or this, obviously the opt-in, theoretically, we should supersede this. Yeah. As long as... Um, so, so just to be clear, there's no way for, for individual members of the public to opt back in through the FPS. The FPS is purely opt-out. If they is want to opt, is that forever? No. It's so if they want to opt back into your charity, they need to go to your charity directly, and you need to keep a record of that consent that you've got from the member of the public that post-states the FPS requests. And as long as you've got that and got that record, that's absolutely fine. But that's the only way that an FPS can be kind of overridden is by directly going to the charity yourself. Okay, I'm okay. um, technical box fan. Um, it allows members of the public to um, suppress for other people. How is this authenticated that they're allowed to do that? So there's, a, there's an initial um, tip box, which I can't remember the exact wording on, but it says something. Yeah, it's basically asking you for... Um, it says that I have, I, have, I have permission to act on their behalf or authority or something. There's a very careful wording that we've been given by some of my lawyers. And then there is that authentication that I described earlier, which means that the person, the on behalf of person, gets a hard copy of the letter that says the suppression has happened so that they have some means of you know, overriding it. <coughs> so expansion on oh sorry on both Greenpeace. Um, so expansion on the previous issue. So if someone opts out on FPS, then they come to our website and opt back in, and then they follow up. Can we get on the phone to talk to them and say, can we clear this up? Um, I don't know. Uh, probably. <laughs> 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 okay. Basically, um, that's a two two work through an example. I think basically the, the point is is that if they once you have evidence that they're happy for you to contact them, you can contact them. Well, I guess all I'm asking is, is the follow up does it's the follow up then trump the opt in? No, that, well, no, the follow up won't trump it. What will okay. trump it is what they've signed up to in, on your website. So if they've just put in their email address without an actual consent, you know, a proper consent no, box and don't put it in whatever else you have to have there, then you know, then you can't contact them. But if it does, if it's a genuine person saying, "I'm really sorry, I made a mistake. Please don't drop me from your mailing list," then you know, of course you can. Right, I'm going to get back to that. Forgive me. Two 
St Mungo's monopolised you there. Really quick, sorry. So one is, are you clear in the promotion of this when, when you've got your comms plan around? <coughs> you're saying this won't, won't affect anything that's unaddressed? Yes. Because obviously our donors yeah. get a little bit confused. We've got a letter in the post from St Mungo's that's fully suppressed, but they've got a door drop. And it's yeah, so we, have, so, we, so we do say, you know, obviously it's not going to stop door to door, it's not going to stop unaddressed, yeah. it's not going to stop, you know, street fundraising, it's not going to stop your direct debits. Yeah. That is it in the content. And then just slightly on the sort of promotional side, it was, you know, obviously we've been slammed as, as charity sector in, in the press a huge amount. How much promotion are you going to do of how the take-up of unsubscribes has gone over the next year? Because as a charity sector, obviously it's great that people are being active and making choices and exercising control. I'm fully with that. But just in terms of it being another excuse for the charity sector to get slammed for the level of unsubscribes, when it's just someone taking positive action. I just wonder what your plans are around that, if you have them yet. Yeah, I was going to say the honest answer is that we're just putting together the comms for the law, which have yeah. law about that. But I, you know, the fundraising regulator generally is on the, on the side of charities. We're not there to slam you. We want to encourage public giving. So, you know, one of our aims would not be to say, you know, look at the millions of people who signed up, isn't it terrible? I mean, that would absolutely not be the angle that we'd be coming from. I think, I think there will be some expectation that we are public, there will be some information just for transparency reasons given on the numbers of use, you know, who use it. Fine. If somebody um, goes on and they give all of their contact information but they don't necessarily choose to suppress channels for which they've given contact information, um, should, will the organisation, will the charity be sent all of the contact information? Okay, so, so, so what I should have said this earlier, so um, you will only be asked to provide the information for the channels that you are asked to suppress. However, you will always be asked for your name and your, post, your postal address, because without that we think there's no chance that you'll match somebody on the database. So if you only want to suppress email, you would just be asked for name, post address and email address. You won't be asked for the, the others. Right. I'll go sort to the back again. Gentlemen. Hello. Just uh, Nick Bolts from Compassion UK. So I have some questions about the experience going through the, the portal for the public. Um, just a complete clarity of what they see. So they are choosing channels to suppress. Yes. rather than channels that it is acceptable to contact with. Yes, the channels. And it starts with all channels not suppressed. Yes. Um, and just following up on the question that was asked by David Pack, what, what's the expectation that's set for them at the end of the process, so when they see that confirmation screen, about what happens next in terms of timing, in terms of you know helping them understand that you know we often operate a month or more ahead? So I, to be honest, I can't remember the exact wording, but it says um, you know, this information will now be passed to the charities. The, the wording on the on the public website is about mainly about stopping communication. So you choose which channels you want to stop. Is kind of I think how we've got it phrased at the moment. Um, and uh, I think it says you know it may take charities tw up to 28 days to stop. I think 28 days is given in that confirmation. It's definitely in the confirmation email. It just say. For some charities where it's personal, this could take longer because of the length of time um, these campaigns are planned for. So that caveat is in there, is reinforced several times, and it's in the email that goes to and, and if you go back in with your reference number because you want to do a follow-up and it isn't 28 days, a little pop-up comes up that says it hasn't been 28 days, you have to wait for 28 days. Right. We've got another question. The mention of not sharing, not sending data outside um, the UK, um, I'm slightly concerned about that because I know that a lot of CRM systems link to the US and are backed up. Um, have you consulted on that and have you got any plans to do that? Um, just, I think that has slightly changed, which I think, I think, yeah, no, I think, I think that what I, I don't know the exact word, but I think it's slightly changed to say something, this is like a terrible paraphrasing of it, but it's something like, or the equivalent of the European... Oh, yeah, the data shield. So if you see it on data shield, it, which it is not specifically... Is it the EAP? Anyway, it's slightly, it's not quite as explicit as that anymore. I can uh, find that out for you. It's changed in the terms of the shield. Right, okay, we'll keep, we'll keep going, then. Um, 
Um, Abby from Health Poverty Action. Um, you mentioned that in the post from Martin, you're going to be saying contact the charity directly for the best opt out. Is there going to be any signposting towards existing services of NPS and TPS? Because that was discussed quite a lot in the early consultation. Is that also on the website or is that just on the marketing? So I think that is also in that final email or SMS confirmation you get. It said there may, there's something that says that you know you may, if you want to, there are, there are other things you can do to stop communication or something, and then there's links to NPS and TPS. That's after. Yeah, that is at the very end of it, yeah, because we there was a version where it was up front and it was just very confusing. So we thought, well, they're there, they do the NPS, and then that's all at the other end, and that's in the FAQs as well. You know, there are these other things people can do, and there's a there's a Royal Mail service. <coughs> okay, I got it. Are there going to be like any fines or anything for organisations that don't like sort of follow troops like you mentioned about the two stage is what I was getting at, but then after that, like for whatever reason if the charity is using that excuse maybe one too many times. So So the first stage is the <coughs> things would become a complaint for the fundraising regulator and obviously we don't have powers to find, but there might be, you know, if there was a serial you know, problem with people not taking the suppression job, I don't know what the problem might be, you know, that, that it may become a complaint that we look into. Um, we do consider these to be Section 11 requests under the Data Protection Act, so obviously there may be a situation where that might come into force and obviously the ICO would then be involved and they do have the power to find, but I mean that is quite a um, long way down the line, it's not a fine that we would have the power to... Um, <coughs> Brian at the back there, and then this gentleman, and I've got one at the back. Yes, I've caught two there, but Brian, I'm a tech great. It seems to me there's a little missing a little bit of this plan in the future. So when a uh, user logs into the portal and submits a, submits a submission request, there's no loop back to say that the charity's actually did. So they log in to make a follow up request, but they can't actually see the charity process their request. That's great. If that's correct, there's any plans in the future to enable that. You're, you're correct, if there isn't, and at the moment there aren't, and partly that was because we didn't want to make it more onerous on charities to then have to go back into the portal to update to say they've done it, so it's, it's you know, we described it as a kind of push service, so we, you know, we get it in and we push it out to charities and you update your stuff and hopefully that's the end of it, but I, I can see that if that is a, if, you know, if the public are really keen on that and they want that closure, that might have to be something we consider in the future, but at the moment it's not in the plans. Um, Lindsay Green from Merlin Cancer Support. Um, I, I suppose two cheeky questions. The first one, just with that slide up there, you talk about the left that's going to our chief exec and she very kindly sort of forwarded on to me, etc. Just not heard anything since we gave you our name. Is that that we haven't heard anything? Yeah, you haven't heard anything. We're waiting to get as many as we can to that stage and right. then early next week, we hope, sometime next week, we'll press the button for the next. Brilliant, okay. Stage. And then the, the sort of supplement to that was, was obviously a big proportion of the that people we have on our database are people that we're providing support to. And I know this is a fundraising preference service, not a, in, in reality, we don't have this sort of really clever way of sort of saying you're suppressing fundraising, we're not suppressing service messages, and we're just quite concerned about that. I just wonder what you thought about that, that area and how we might tackle that. Yeah, so, I don't, so again, this is one of those areas that I don't really have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. But I assume this, you know, I don't know what have you been doing up until now about that. I don't know how you. We've been fairly black and white, unfortunately, trying to explain to customers that, largely speaking, if you opt out, we can't send you anything. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we are looking at how we can have a preference <coughs> layer below that, but that really is very complicated because preferences change so quickly based on a customer's circumstance. You could put down and say, preference, never send them this, but then tomorrow they may go through a cancer a diagnosis and then all of a sudden, and you're stuck. So. There's just, I think collectively we just need, need to work through that, that yeah. going forward. And say, there isn't an easy answer, believe me, we have one, we yeah, really share it with you. Yeah. Um, but, but I think just to sort of plant the seed yeah. and just say they might certainly need to have a conversation about if it happens too often. And I think that's the real test. Yeah. Isn't it? Let's see what happens in practice. Let's see how we get it. Yeah. Okay, there's a lady at the back. Hi, um, I'm Aisha from MSN UK. Um, I just wanted to know if you could comment on the fact have like a data retention policy on them? Um, at the moment? Yeah, so, um, we, so all the data will be kept on the system for two years and that was because that is as long as we think it could ever take for 
something to go through the system, have the 28 days, have some more days, um, go to our complaints team, our team do an investigation, do an adjudication, publish the adjudication. So two years is how long it will be available for. And that's obviously, that's made clear to members of the privacy statement. Okay, I've got Gentlemen, just the back of the mic. Um, sorry, I've got a part from that. Is there a date of suppression um, supplied in the part? Yes. Sorry, if you have. <coughs> sorry, yeah, Alex, Amnesty International. Um, do you have any projections for how good might be using this service in the first year? No, it's been very, it's, no. And um, we've, got, so we've got no real projections of how many might use it. And similarly, we haven't talked about it today, but there is a telephone helpline for people who won't be able to use the web. And it's been really hard to work out with the contact centre who are doing that work for us how many calls to expect. It's just very, very difficult to predict. I'm going to do that in two, two more of them. Um, take the idea again. Just, just on a similar thing to follow up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's really simple. Um, have you got any concept of what the dropout rate will be between somebody filling it in and not completing the authentication? No, but that's just that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just in terms of the automatic downloads, um, if someone selects to opt out of all, it looked like that was going to come through as one line with a type of global. Um, would it not be easier to just create a line for each one? Yes, yes. Is that an option? Yes. It's tick box. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> tick box. Yeah. There's a gentleman first in the back. And then um, this thank you. Sorry, there's another question about the automatic um, transmission. So I've understood that that is automatically pushed to uh, an SFTP server that we provide. Yeah. What's the frequency that that's sent out with? You actually and get do we get a null file if there's no requests, or do we just get nothing? So basically, you get um, you get to set up and say when you want it. So uh, um, what day? Right down to what day you want it delivered on. Um, what well, I should point out: Do you remember you saw with the users was where there was um, a uh, you could have requests sent to you immediately, weekly, monthly. Even if you get no requests, we send a monthly email explaining that you've had none as a confirmation. So. Even if you've got them, we actually send that confirmation on, on the month to the users to say there hasn't been any. So you're not, you know, it's not that anything's gone awry. You're, you're generally not having anything. Diane from Am I right in assuming that once the person has opted out, we're not able to um, to write to them to let them know that we've, um, we've actually verified their requests um, at all? So, they, so we, we don't have, ever have the opportunity to thank them for their support. And also, I'm just interested if we know that that person has left us a legacy, for example, they've left us a legacy, um, it's, would that be an exception? So, um, I am not an expert on the protection of consent, and I know there are circumstances in which, you know, the law does allow you to make contact with them um, for, you know, administrative purposes or whatever. Um, I think the assumption is, is that people are coming onto the FPS because they really don't, you know, they really don't want to hear from you. And so we don't think that charities should need to contact the donor again to do that thank you or you know one last chance or you know that's kind of the reason they're at the FPS. So. Right. Anything else there? I haven't been looking at my Facebook page or as I've been looking at the phone, but I'm just looking at texts and twitters and, <laughs> and messages here to try and differentiate between the questions we've already asked and some others there. Um, but one of them has been, um, how is this all going to be paid for? Mm -hmm. Well, the it's funded from the levy that funds the fundraising regulator. So those of you that have contributed to the levy or paid your registration fees, that's how we're paying for the fundraising preference service. So there's no charge to access the data. No one is going to be charged um, to, to go onto the portal and sign up. If you um, haven't paid your levy and you get lots of suppression requests, we might write to you again and say, you're getting lots of suppression requests and you haven't paid for this. Um, but there's no charge otherwise for using the FPS. Right, I'll go back and let them know now. Is there anything else? Because most of the questions there, you've actually been covering. So that's an interesting one, despite all that. David. Sorry, a bit tacky. 
Um, you talked about we talked about people maybe fraudulently going on there and pretending to have permission and stuff like that. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the the two stage process you're going through there, and I'm, I'm, it might be that I'm not picky enough actually, but I'm wondering whether that's perfectly secure from things like robots. Yeah, don't worry. I'm well aware of people picking up the uh, yellow pages or, or rather the phone directories and trying to automate going through, which is why we have the caveats for looking for basically lots of what we would consider to be unusual activity. So we have unusual, if we spot unusual so activity, you've got a load from the same IP address, yeah, all that, not just that same ranges, you know, basically we've got alarm bells um, going off and things like that. Because essentially it's a sort of a we can find it once it's happening, we, can't, we don't necessarily stop it It's, it's it not necessarily that you're going to have anybody malicious, it could just be you have some new mischievous who um, thinks that, you know, going through the telephone directory and, and um, deciding to uh, go through FPS and unsubscribe somebody would be something funny to do. Um, so, <laughs> yes, we do look for that sort I, of I think that's we use, for example, we use capture on ours, where you actually have to eyeball the screen and there have to be human beings who actually do it. Where if robots, if you've got an email being sent, you can get robots that are clever enough. No, we look, we look for the activity. But it's very much a balancing act of having accessibility. So the problem with those captures is that often it takes you several goes. Um, and I'm sure everybody's been frustrated with them when you're going through. So it was about accessibility as much as it was um, the, the security and validation. So. I'm guessing, I'm guessing if one charity all of a sudden gets a lot of... Um, a lot of messages that the charity will have the opportunity to come back to you and say, can you investigate this please, because this feels like yeah. something malicious. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we could get, if there was excessive activity, we definitely would yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. One at the back. <laughs> yeah, there's a question about, um, if you talk about the future, once this goes live, is there a schedule for reviews or any um, roll up future changes to the service? Mm. Well, that was the other question. Yeah. There will be. <laughs> we come by the schedule for review. Um, we don't. Um, obviously, there's so many unknowns in this, particularly around what the usage is going to be for this and the contact centre. But I think we'll learn some lessons fairly quickly. Um, and so, there, you know, we will know within, I imagine, the first three months, or even probably sooner. The fact that call centre will seem to deal with things in like days, don't they? Um, but we'll know fairly quickly if there's changes we need to make, or you know anything that the volume has kind of grown up for us. So I think there might be an initial kind of, you know, stock take and then there'll be some more plan structured, you know, three, six. Um, okay. We've got, we've got one thing there, so we've got the sort of Have you got any plans to update the code to cover the yes. yes. So those changes um, are just um, being agreed now. Um, and obviously we've been talking to the IOF about that. And so there will be a few um, changes made quite, you know, obviously pre-launch, um, just to make sure that the NPS is covered in the code. I think there's some suggestions of stuff being covered in the convention. It's not. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there is a slot. I'm not actually entirely sure what's being covered, but some, I'm sure some things is going to be in the Right, so what's that space for the convention? Sorry, I know I've heard those questions. This is a small charity hat. Can I just confirm, if you are a, a small, small charity, you will still get a notification if someone registers to unsubscribe from you, even if you are not registered. Absolutely. So and you at that point, you register, yeah. and at that point you pay the 50... You don't have to pay. No, you, don't. you don't have to pay. You don't. So small charities will still find out. Yeah, so and small then, charities, the, the message to small charities is they don't have to do anything until a suppression is registered against them. So it's no action until something comes through that says, you know, you've had a suppression request, go and you know, get yourself on the system. And then just because I was asking about being flamed about how many people sign up, just from the perspective of being um, a charity that can benefit from how this is going, is there going to be any benchmarking figures on, on unsubscribes that are available to the charities that do the levy? Is there going to be any sort of, wow, we're doing, we've got barely any unsubscribes compared to lovely prices and lovely chat. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't mind me asking. I think we have to think about that really carefully. It's not, it's not the plan or intention at the moment to do benchmarking, but you know, we'll see. Right, yeah, um, 
in order to uh, minimise mismatches between people signing up and matching to uh, people on our database, is there any plans to have that validation on the consumer sign-up? There is. There is validation on it. Yeah. Okay, so there will be selecting their address from a list when they put in their first yeah, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? There? Just a quick one regarding the code. Is there going to be ever an expectation for charities to promote the access? <laughs> Not at the moment. That's not in the changes to the code. The changes to, into the code, and I should know the solution today, but I can't actually remember them. But they're very specifically about accepting um, FPS requests, you know, suppression requests from a third party, such as the FPS. Those are the changes that have been proposed so far. Um, obviously, we'd love you to promote it, but at the moment, there's no obligation on anyone <coughs> to do that. Okay. Any other questions now? A few people haven't had any questions. That's interesting. <coughs> One more then. So it is, okay. it is related to the questions that are still in, but uh, it is quite important. If you could, if it's sent around, because obviously the, what, the 6th of July is it's very close now, but if you could send around the guidance that you have with regard to um, exporting data outside of the UK, outside of the UK, that's we, that's can put, we can really put that up. We're just updating the FAQs for charities about the FPS <coughs> Now we've just finalised the text today, so you can easily add one about that um, to make it clear. Okay, David, one last question. First of all, I just want to say thank you very much for coming tonight and sharing all with us. Um, it's been great that we've been able to have that sort of constant dialogue with the FPS um, and, and, and the fundraiser and the um, Last question is I've, obviously, you've been working with charities today in terms of putting together this documentation and stuff like that. When you, as, as, being, as the service launches and, and you get feedback and stuff like that, are those same charities or other charities going to be consulted if you start to make changes or you need to make changes? Are they going to be kept on board? Is there going to be that sort of collegiate approach to making changes? Um, I haven't thought about changes yet, I'm just thinking about getting it out for it to be. Yeah, I guess, I guess we will then have a database of lots of people's contact details who use the system. I mean, whether or not that's an appropriate um, way of doing it, detail. <laughs> be careful. No, I, but yeah, I think you know we would want to. You know, we've really tried to get people involved. We have had ten charity <laughs> testers from all the database suppliers. We have sent that farm to over thirty database suppliers to make sure they were happy with the format. So you know, I'm sure we'll be doing more of that. It's, it's yeah. more about the fact that we, as we all do. We, we, do, we try our best the first time and then we test it and we tweak it later. Yeah. And it's just that you've obviously worked with charities and with suppliers for all, that, all this for the initial rollout. I'm just thinking, are you going to carry on working with them for the tweaks, etc., going forward? I imagine you probably aren't, but. Yeah, no, I know people are keen and get in touch, and you know, we'll always add you to the wiki pile. Great, thank you. Okay. In, in which case, huge thank you to Dave Zia and Nikki. We have no doubt now how that will work. There's going to be TV problems with that without a doubt and the system will. But that has really been helpful to be able to go away and try the process of the system. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that just needs to be with two. <laughs> Is it something now? Okay, well, two, 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 just two quick ones. I'll, I'll keep short. Just for those people who, who aren't members, this is an ideal opportunity to be able to influence a few patrons like this. And there is a 20% discount for Dave. It's a lie on 19th of And put the discount code tech stroke group you'll get that discount. But those of us that want to continue networking and bouncing any of these ideas, we should be going round the corner to the Beehive, which is on the corner of Durham Street and Harley Road, um, to be able to discuss these things a bit more and then put forward networking. Thank you so much.